slow, or being so simple as that it's slow. Typically, you see the range of about uh, 1 to 10 nits. 10 nits being like average crazy nits. Uh, level of support, though, can vary greatly between ports because, unlike QMU, there's the code sharing uh, hasn't quite come uh, caught on to a lot of people. Uh, a lot of the architectures, they're older before the common code really started to develop, or they just felt like developing it all themselves, so they don't really want to make the common code. Uh, so some of them uh, really only support ISA, which is what I was referring to the virtual mode. Uh, some support uh, full operating system mode, some support user Linux mode, uh, somewhere in between in there. Really, you have to go ahead and hopefully there's documentation on your architecture <coughs> and see what they support. And they will <coughs> Obviously, we have branch support, so conditional branching, indirect branching, direct calls. 
her uh, uh, imprint. Yeah, work. But basically, it's allowed you to do direct testing of. Uh, we know all of these. These are all the invalid instruction codes. So if you have some value that doesn't fit into this table, it's invalid. Uh, and ideally, when you're simulating code, you're not going to be simulating invalid code. So we're focusing on making sure all the valid outputs come out uh, as expected. Uh, so that allows us to narrow down. But when we look at and compare the, the black and hardware versus QEMU on the host, 
we can see that uh, you know when our buffers are really tiny, it actually the, the black and the harbor actually outperforms simulation. Then as the buffers increase to anything over 2K, the uh, QEMU even memory subsystem today will run twice, two and a half times as fast as actually the hardware does. And again, that's because buffers in uh, memory bandwidth on x86s are faster than 16-bit uh, um, uh, DDR controllers. So, you know, faster buses mean faster simulated performance. And uh, the other thing is, you know, faster core speeds of the host mean faster simulated performance. The downside is, is that the more instructions that we have to use on the host to simulate those um, target instructions, the slower it's going to be. So we can look at a benchmark like Drystone and say that, okay, Drystone is mainly mem copy and string copy and string length and, you know, these kind of basic string benchmarks, which are fairly um, pedantic opcodes on the target, which translate into very few opcodes on the host. When we start doing more complex uh, benchmarks with lots of those DSP instructions like Mike was showing last time, it takes many, many more host instructions to emulate one uh, target instruction. So the, the performance does go down. So the complexity is, is that your target performance, even if you get X on one bar benchmark, you'll never get the same result on a different benchmark. It actually depends on what instructions you're actually decoding in what order. So when we, um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of this testing, you know, one of the problems we came upon was uh, actually how do we make sure that our simulation environment and our hardware is exactly the same? Because we're not the chip designers. Um, we didn't, you know, we're basically going off public available documentation, just like uh, many of you would when uh, you develop things. It's how do you make sure that when you're developing the simulated environments and you port it over to your hardware, you're actually going to get the same result. And you know, don't get this mismatch of behavior. And uh, so what we decided to do was a combination of direct and random tests. And you know, the, the directed, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, that's a directed test. <laughs> yeah. With Windows. Um, what if you select it and you highlight the text? I, I, because this is a PDF, I don't think so. No, uh, the error is that it kind of blows up on it. Yeah. Change the size? I don't think that's going to make a difference. Next time you use the uh, Yeah. Full <laughs> screen. Full screen. Anyway, this was just an example that uh, did some initial setup, uh, loaded uh, four into a register, uh, subtracted one, and made sure the result was five. And that was basically written by hand just to test that instruction, that single instruction. And then this right down here is the word pass. <laughs> you have to take my word for it. And, uh, you know, directed tests, there's lots and lots of directed tests, both in the GNU simulator and then there's sign in the QEMU. Um, these are actually the number of uh, individual test files and then the size of that directed source, the size of the source. So you can see the QE era, the GNU sim has lots and lots of directed tests because it was primarily developed by the GNU community who likes to have lots and lots of directed tests because that's what they're comfortable with because they do a lot of testing on the compiler and testing on BFB and testing on these things. They want to ensure that there's no regressions when uh, somebody fixes a bug. Uh, QEMU really doesn't have that. Um, they, don't, they don't really have that. They, they test, they boot a kernel, as long as the kernel boots, that's awesome. And they fix a bug and they run, they boot another kernel, as long as the kernel boots, that's great, they must have fixed the bug. Uh, what, what kind of things they introduce and what kinds of things they don't introduce, you know, it's, uh, it really, really just depends on uh, what's happening. And, and even us in the new simulator, when we fix a bug, we introduce a bug and have to go back and fix all kinds of things. It's because there isn't a lot of, um, because the documentation for most CPU architectures suck. You end up uh, having to interpret the way hardware actually works when the documentation says it works one way and the hardware is actually doing something else. You actually have to go down to the guy who, who sometimes designed it and actually look at the schematics or look at the bear log or, or look at these kinds of things in the desk. Yeah, which, uh, which, is, which isn't something most people can do. Um, the other thing to note is there are a lot of simulation ports that a new simulator has which don't have any test uh, infrastructure right now. 
they're completely empty. So it's not that the new simulator is better, it just has more architectures with more things. But it doesn't mean that regressions don't slip in. So, you know, we have a, a like, awesome, a uh, single black construction, like uh, the one Mike and I was showing up here before, where it was like a multiplied team lane with a, uh, a lowest store, where um, the possible inputs are two accumulators and uh, two registers. So we have any combination of 2 to the 40, which are the accumulator lengths, and 2 to the two, uh, 32 bit registers, which basically gives you um, 2 times 10 to the 43 different combinations of inputs to one single instruction. And if we could get a simulator that ran at a gigahertz, it would basically take 10 to the 26 years to actually test every single combination of permutation of that single instruction, which is uh, you know longer than the life of the sun. By a long, 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 long time. By a long, long, long time, exactly. So you know, further complicated by you know different register combinations. So this was only a single, two single registers. There could be you know R zero to seven and R zero to seven that has these uh, two different register inputs. So again, the single instruction with nine different saturation flights. So trying to test, a, trying to think is like I want to test a single instruction with every combination and every permutation of inputs is just not practical. So what we do is we uh, do random test generation. We run these random tests on the hardware. We generate uh, basically a script that uh, checks each value and what they should be and then um, runs out of the simulator to actually generate tests. And obviously this is going to be... <laughs> so we, we basically do what I said is that uh, we have a GP dash file which basically uh, connects to some target hardware, uh, uploads a file, runs a script. The GDB script basically checks old status versus new status if there's a difference. In uh, after instruction, it prints out what it should check, and uh, it'll actually generate on the fly test cases for you. And it'll actually, when a test does fail on the simulator, the infrastructure will actually generate a standalone test case that you can then use to actually debug the, uh, the simulation hardware. So what we did is on this this Blackfin system, which you know booted kernels, ran the GCC and Fortran test suites with no you know differences between hardware and simulator. You know, random testing did actually find what I would consider a huge amount of bugs, which included like um, the status register problems, uh, construction correctness issues, rounding saturation problems, uh, fixed point fractional problem problems, and documentation problems. And we now actually have a uh, system that has run over 150 million random instructions, both on the hardware generating these test cases, running them on the simulator, and then comparing them all. And you know, it's it's basically taking a dedicated machine um, almost uh, two months to actually get up to 150 million. So you know, some of the issues with random testing is because we're actually testing the simulator on a, on a ISS. Uh, there's no cache. We don't model the cache, so we can't actually test to see what's going to happen if there's any side effects of doing a, a deflush or a flush or an eye flush on the hardware. That we need to emulate the simulator. So we just don't do that. Uh, there's no supervisor instructions or resources that are, are um, tested because we're testing on, the, on the, the Linux side under user space. Uh, the program counter isn't checked, so we don't get to check branches, loops, jumps, calls, etc., which are mainly done with those um, you know, uh, 15 meg of directive tests. Uh, there's no stack, we don't test the stack instructions because again, if we test this on the, when we're testing this on the hardware, we test under Linux user space and randomly manipulating the stack and writing different data in the stack can uh, cause no, no bounds of grief. Um, one of the other issues is uh, multiple opcodes can actually disassemble the same mnemonic. So in one of those complex uh, DSP instructions that Mike was showing, where you had uh, two multiplied accumulates that were happening in the same second, there's two fields in that uh, that actually are these OP1 and OP0, where if, depending upon if they're both ones, it's a not which basically gives us uh, 4 million combinations of 32-bit uh, not construction. So the assembler only gives us one opcode, but 4 million opcodes will actually give us the same instruction. That will do basically nothing on the hardware. When we're doing this random testing, we only test one of those 4 million operations. Because like Mike was saying, we're really testing for correctness of 
compiler generated in uh, handwritten code. You had a question? Yeah. <coughs> um, the question is, uh, you're trying to test the simulator, and uh, what is the difference between what you're, uh, what you're trying to do and what the uh, CPU vendor uh, would like to do when he wants to test his hardware? I mean, you're facing the same thing. No, thing. It, it, facing exactly the same thing. So, uh, analog devices is a... And obviously, they don't yeah. uh, use all combinations, like you mentioned, seven... No, so this is, this is basically how they test the, the hardware as well. They have, um, when a, uh, an architecture manufacturer is trying to verify their hardware actually works, they'll have the same thing. They'll actually have their golden reference simulation model, and they'll test their hardware against it with a random uh, suite just like this. The, the difference is, is that we take the output of this and actually put it into QEMU or put it into the new sim. Um, mostly CPU manufacturers, if you look at ARM, for example, they don't arm ink doesn't support QEMU or the new SIM because they want to buy their proprietary uh, simulation environment. performance of your core as a 
itself that, uh, you know, depending on the port or the project you're working with, uh, the experience of just how accurate that ISO might be uh, can vary, you know, greatly. Uh, oftentimes, testing is an afterthought for software developers. You know, they, they want to focus on all the shiny, fun stuff, uh, get it up and running, and then basically be like, I'm done. But you got to verify that all that stuff actually works because users that you're shipping this to uh, are the ones that are going to be doing this. So what comes up are uncommon instructions uh, or esoteric options, uh, flags to instructions. You know, it's probably be showing like the ALU instruction, I guess the attempt to. Uh, it has nine different flags that modify the behavior of that structure in different ways. And while the compiler may generate maybe three of those most of the time, uh, users running hand code and assembly, you know, maybe tweak some of those other ones. So you really got to drill down and make sure all the edge pieces are, hand are handled. And then sometimes you just have design trade offs. Uh, correctness, uh, you know, exact hardware behavior may be sacrificed. Sake of speed, uh, something you just have to check and be aware of. Uh, so, you know, common cases are important. So, when you're testing QM, you, you know, you have the kernel, you have display, you log in, you type some commands, it all works, sure, satisfies 90% of people out there. But uh, all these uncommon and esoteric cases, that's where they really get all the uh, guys who like to whine a lot. It's that 1% that nobody tests, and well, it probably doesn't work. Uh, and hopefully, the documentation, you know, covers all of these things. Helps you to make judgments as to what to go with, what to try. That's the only something you wrote. Can you come up with the examples of this whiny stuff? Like, what kind of stuff can there be not tested and uh, will have problems when used? You mean like the. This for, for this 1%. Uh, well, I mean, like the uncommon instructions. Uh, like in the black pen, there is a uh, behavior to control the rounding of registers. Uh, yeah, so there's um, in, in various DSP algorithms, you actually want to round different ways than what ANSI says you want to. So there's an option to round the way ANSI says and an option to round the way that some DSP algorithms want. Mm -hmm. um, when we test most of this, when we test almost everything here, we actually test only the ANSI version. And uh, so if you flip the bit and expect the simulator to actually work, the simulator bit will flip and the rounding will still just do ANSI. So I guess it's just a matter of like, you know, the compiler would never generate code to flip that bit. Basically, you would only see that if somebody was writing hand coding DSP algorithms. You know, they would flip that bit and do something, stick to the top rounding in a different way, and look sad. So, you know, obviously, that's something we're aware of. The hardware design team has a much different um, test methodology and some, even sometimes test goals than, because they're, they're testing their goal the simulator versus the hardware and we actually wait till the hardware comes out and make sure that even some of the um, uh, anomalies that actually ended up in the hardware that they didn't actually catch during their verification phase actually end up in our simulator. 
so that that way, you know, the hardware and what you use as a simulation environment are actually exactly the same. So I, I'm not sure if there's actually something that we could do different to speed up the process, just because the, the goals are, are a little bit different between what the hardware goals are and the software developer goals are. And because their simulator is cycle accurate, because that's actually one of the things that they want to make sure is that, you know, if something only takes one cycle in their simulation, it only takes one cycle in the hardware. Whereas we don't care. It can take five cycles in the hardware and it takes one cycle in, the sim in our simulation in the key mule. Yeah, I mean, like the, the, the goals between our two teams are a bit different. You know, theirs is verification before they actually put out processors, whereas ours are geared towards any customers doing software development who want it to match the hardware. I mean, in terms of things different, we wish they would write the documentation to be accurate, but <laughs> <laughs> we end up sending, well, sending a lot of emails that, you know, documentation says this, hardware says that. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's like it's a good presentation, but I, I think you kind of implying the purpose for which you're using by simulation, the purpose for may, maybe a verification of the hardware or maybe something like that. When I hear simulation, I mostly think about virtualization. So when people use QEMU, they mostly use, well, I, I don't know, like they can use it for verification of the hardware or hardware related issues, but more, I mean, when people say QEMU in a lot of uh, Linux sort of uh, professionals that work with it, they think about KVM, right? When you use it for virtualization, you don't really care about cycle accurate, you don't really care about whether the hardware is emulated in a real way. You only care about whether it can run something there without the errors, and then you can migrate it, then you can checkpoint it to whether, like, yeah, however yeah. you want it. So but, it, but how do you actually make sure KVM is actually the same as what the hardware is? Does, I don't care. That, that's the point. Well, I, okay. <laughs> that's the fucking problem. Why? <laughs> is if it's if it's not the same, then you're verifying something that has bugs in it, and you run it on the hardware, and it doesn't work. I don't verify it. J just and and people, for you, example, you, who you use assume, KVM. You assume it is correct. Uh, what I'm saying is you can't make that assumption. I think the other aspect is we're not approaching it from a virtualization aspect. I mean, I know virtualization is huge with QVM or KVM. You know, getting both machines running so you it's kind of like replacing. Oh yeah. Well, we use it when we're talking about it's both of the embedded developer. We have cross compiling. We're not, we don't really care about virtualization at all. We're focused on, you know, developing software for a target cross compiling. And, yeah, two very different areas. <laughs> so. One of the problems I had playing with QM a while ago was just trying to get a definition of, you know, all the right peripherals and all that stuff. Does that happen any better? Yeah, I think the next talk is supposed to be starting uh